Have you been reading my letters? Magnus Pym showed an aptitude for spying at a very early age. Aunt Nell gets her wobblies from a bottle. And by the time he left school, he'd almost perfected it. Perfect Winter Viewing starts Thursday night on ABC. South Australia's high-tech radar and sonar industry could get a welcome boost from a new federal government policy to promote and export arms and defence equipment. We'll have details of this change of policy tonight at 7.30. STA fares set to rise by about 10%. Michael Mansell heads for Libya to seek trade sanctions against Australia. And if you're one of Adelaide's 12,000 motorists who run red lights, watch out. Good evening, Jane Doyle welcoming you to ABC News on this rather cold and wet winter's night. Also in this bulletin, metal industry employers confirm they are prepared to pay two wage increases next year. Four telecom employees face an Adelaide court on charges of fraud and oversees a landmark decision where a tobacco company has been found guilty of contributing to the death of a smoker. But first, to the local scene. Public transport fares are set to jump by about 10%. A recommendation for higher fares was discussed by State Cabinet today and as Jim Coots reports, the rise is likely to take effect next month. There's no doubt there will be an increase in fares this year. The STA wants much more than the annual inflation rate of around 6%. I understand the government is considering a rise of about 10% to keep costs in check and ensure the STA's annual deficit of $116 million doesn't blow out further. It's likely multi-trip users will suffer the least, possibly only a five cent increase. But cash ticket buyers and smaller subsidised fares could be facing at least a 10 cent jump. Sources say the government wants to minimise multi-trip ticket rises. The last fare rise was in September, and at that time cash fares rose by 25%, although the introduction of multi-trip tickets reduced fares for many commuters. And while fare increases will undoubtedly lead to bad publicity, the Transport Minister, Gavin Keneally, earlier announced an STA drive to lift its image. He says independent analysis shows that the transport system is the cheapest and second most efficient in Australia. Well, there's nothing the matter with the STA, and that is what this program, or this campaign, is going to show to the people of South Australia. It is their public transport system, and there is a very negative attitude about the STA abroad in South Australia. It is an unfair uh, and unreasonable attitude. The campaign begins tomorrow and will cost $25,000. The law is about to catch up to the 12,000 South Australian motorists who run red lights each year. State Cabinet today gave the go-ahead to set up 15 camera-controlled intersections in Adelaide. From July the 1st, if you drive through a red light at one of a number of intersections, don't be surprised if you get a fine in the mail a couple of weeks later. State Cabinet today approved the operation of the cameras at 15 intersections from Elizabeth to Oaklands Park. Actually, there'll only be five cameras and they will be rotated between the designated intersections. The cameras detect drivers by photographing the car and its number plate. Cabinet also decided to set a fine of $70, the same as for someone who runs a red light and is apprehended on the spot. There'd been some speculation the government may increase the fee for those caught by the camera. Offenders will be given a photograph copy of their offence and if you believe you weren't in the car, you can make a statutory declaration explaining your whereabouts. All approaches to the 15 intersections will carry warning signs. The cameras will be assessed in about six months and it's hoped they will cut back the number of people who run a red light, believed to be up to 12,000. Industrial action by South Australian police officers is set to escalate unless the state government agrees to renegotiate pay rises to more than 250 officers. As John Chapman reports, the Police Association will meet Emergency Services Minister Dr Hopgood on Friday in a bid to settle the dispute. Under the restructure announced late last year, South Australian police were given pay rises averaging 12%. But for Level 1 senior constables, the rise amounts to 3.8%. However, the implementation of the restructure has been delayed, with the Police Association claiming the government has refused to negotiate the timing of the introduction of the new system. The delay in paying the backdated increase has angered most police while middle-ranking members say they've been treated unfairly and believe an 8 to 10% increase is more appropriate. 
One senior police member said he and fellow officers are quite prepared to stop all revenue raising duties until the government considers their claim. Already some officers have abandoned issuing on the spot traffic fines and are either cautioning or summonsing offenders to court. Police Association President Barry Lovegrove warned today any unauthorised industrial action could jeopardise all planned wage increases. No, whilst negotiations are continuing, uh, we hope that none of our members will take any industrial action that may prejudice those negotiations. However, officers meeting at Stirling this afternoon backed a decision to call a special meeting of all South Australian police within 30 days. It's not our fault that we are senior constables. Uh, it's something the department created that rank many, many years ago. So why should we at this stage be used as scapegoats? Today's continual rain has caused isolated local flooding in Adelaide. The city's southern suburbs were the worst affected, as Tony Hull reports. The Weather Bureau says 8.4 millimetres of rain has fallen in the city since 9 o'clock this morning. The worst affected suburbs were Flagstaff Hill, Maslin's Beach, O'Sullivan's Beach, Hackham, Ranella and Morfitt Vale. The MFS, CFS and SES were all involved in water pumping operations. Some properties in Berman Drive and York Street, Flagstaff Hill suffered interior flooding. Residents say it isn't the first time they've been flooded and are blaming the local council. The SES says storm water pipes have not been handling the runoff, but the organisation says some residents have got into trouble because they've neglected to install storm water drainage on their own properties. The Bureau says the rain should ease tonight, but there'll be more rain late tomorrow. Wide differences have emerged in the federal opposition over John Howard's rejection of a treaty with Aborigines. A former coalition minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Senator Peter Baum, says he was working on a similar agreement when he was a member of the Fraser government. Political correspondent Jim Middleton. Senator Peter Baum was Aboriginal Affairs Minister between 1980 and 82. While he prefers the Aboriginal term makarata for what the Hawke government is trying to achieve, he does not share John Howard's blanket opposition to the Prime Minister's efforts. I think what we were trying to do in government, and I suspect what the Prime Minister is trying to do, is to try to advance the condition and the prospects for Aboriginal people, and we would all share that as a very good and caring goal. While Senator Bohm's intervention may be something of a surprise, there was an entirely predictable reaction from the government to the opposition leader's claim that a treaty would be divisive. It does nobody any good to be using a sort of emotive language that's been used by the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Hand also defended the attack on the Opposition from his department head, Charles Perkins, saying it was understandable. For his part, Mr Perkins lashed out at the Coalition, claiming it always denigrated and decried anything embarked on by Aborigines. It is racist. Yes, it is. I mean, that's prejudice. That's racism. That's the basis of racism. When the Australian people understand what the implications are of a treaty, I think the overwhelming majority will vigorously oppose this issue. It could well turn out to be very similar to the Bill of Rights debate and the ID card. It's the second time in recent weeks that John Howard has abandoned a bipartisan approach on a sensitive subject. First, it was immigration. Now, it's Aborigines. Mr Howard obviously thinks there's something to be gained by drawing a sharp distinction between the government and the coalition on two policies where there's been bipartisan understanding for more than a decade. And while the debate over the proposed treaty rages on, Michael Mansell is tonight heading for Libya with his own scheme to get rights for Aborigines. He's leading an Aboriginal and Maori mission which will seek trade sanctions against Australia. Once on this trail, Michael Mansell said today, there could be no turning back. He was leading a mission of 12 Aborigines and two Maoris to Libya, an appointment with Colonel Gaddafi, condemned by the government and sectors of the Aboriginal community. He'd been left no choice, he said, by the people he referred to as the Chameleon Hawk and the Mouse Howard. I would much prefer to sit down around a negotiating table with the Prime Minister or anybody else and bring about some change uh, by consensus. Um, However, if that's not available, then we have to pursue this sort of thing. So what would he be seeking in Libya? Uh, trade sanctions uh, is one. Uh, access to uh, legal resources they've got so that we can mount an action in the International Court of Justice against Australia over the question of who does own this country. Uh, thirdly, access to other uh, countries that Libya has connections with so that we may talk with them as well. 
uh, again to put pressure on Australia and also to support our action against the Australian International Court of Justice and a range of other measures um, which are particularly private to the Aboriginal delegation. Michael Mansell's last gesture before leaving was to produce an Aboriginal passport. He leaves this message on his home telephone recorder. Unfortunately, I can't take your call because I've got the message from the big G, that is the Colonel, that he wants all Aborigines in Libya. Unfortunately, we can't get all of us over there, but at least some of us, some of us are going. The former South Australian Premier, Mr Don Dunstan, has been appointed as an advisor to the State Government on Aboriginal matters. In making the announcement tonight, the Aboriginal Affairs Minister, Mr Crafter, said that Mr Dunstan would consult with Aboriginal communities about setting up their own forms of community management. At his Norwood home tonight, Mr Dunstan spoke with Jim Coots. South Australia has always been in the vanguard and I think it appropriate that it stay there. I realise you've only, you know, it's only been officially announced today, but uh, how important is the idea of community government to the Aboriginal groups, in your opinion? Well, I think it really is quite vital. Uh, you know, if we are to get away from the kind of paternalist nonsense which is constantly put about by the European community in Australia with regard to Aborigines, we have to give them the means of making decisions for themselves. And that's what this is about. With only two days to go before the national wage case, employers remain split over whether workers should get inflation-based pay rises next financial year. Today, metal industry employers strengthened the ACTU's pay case by agreeing to support two pay rises for up to half a million workers. But that agreement puts employer groups at loggerheads. As the ACTU's campaign for a 6% pay rise has progressed, a number of major employers have caved in to the point where their ranks are well and truly split. On one side is the Confederation of Australian Industry, which says no to inflation-based pay rises, and the Business Council, which says there should be only a small rise. But they're up against the aviation and road transport employers who've agreed to maintain real wages, and building and metal industry employers who've gone further by saying there should be a 3% pay rise soon, with another rise later next financial year. The metal industry says the proposed wage rises are fair and affordable. We're going into the full bench taking a very constructive, mature approach. We take the view that if the unions are expected by us to behave in a